where did you see the intersection of sports and athlete activism really take root? Um, and in some ways, this is just prompting like what inspired you to like write this book or write the things that you've been writing that like preceded this book? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's the, the big thing about that is uh, we've been here for many years, decades even, that uh, politics should not be in sports. Okay. But um, it's, it's been there. It's been uh, read in the history, you know, to take it even further back. We're talking about 1875, 10 years after the Civil War, the Kentucky Derby uh, was established, and the jockeys who rode those horses were former slaves, hmm. right? And you're talking about um, these athletes at the time who rode these horses um, were earning what is the equivalent of the millionaire athletes today. The issue, though, is when 1896 came about and we had the Plessy versus Ferguson case, um, which, of course, among other things, the most glaring aspect of that case was the separate but equal clause, which brought in all of the, 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 the Jim Crow era. <clears throat> those athletes were essentially kicked out of those sports and uh, became obsolete. And some of them became so um, downtrodden and distraught with that particular verdict for them in sports, it, you know, some of them ended up committing suicide because mm. it was so much. You know, you're talking about athletes who were supporting their families and building up communities over a hundred years ago to now people probably didn't even know that there were a lot of black jockeys there today. And so, um, you know, taking it to a more recent account, <clears throat> once, once we got into the 80s, early 90s, that became the commodification of uh, athletes, meaning that TV rights, big contracts, uh, endorsements um, became larger than ever before. And so there was this common law concept that if I'm going to pay you all this money, if I'm a team owner, then you just need to do what we say, be quiet, you'll earn your money. And so you know, without the fear of being ostracized, they did, they did just that. And so for me, um, what got me then into writing this book is the fact that we know that there was a dormancy. You know, we saw the Michael Jordan famous quote. We also saw the Charles Barkley famous, uh, I am not a role model, you know, to which he was trying to clarify later that he was saying that, you know, while I do admire people admiring me, you know, teachers and doctors and lawyers should be admired too. And we get that. But, you know, Charles Barkley has a flair <laughs> mm -hmm. for the dramatic. And so, um, but what got me then to point to this is like never before relative to athletes who are in the limelight who are getting paid millions of dollars uh, in endorsements, several of them now are coming out against. Um, social justice issues. They are um, using social media, which is, a, of course, a, a powerful platform to get their messages out there. Um, and uh, they are teaming up with various grassroots organizations, social justice organizations, to, to, to push their message forward. And when Colin Kaepernick received all of that vitriol for his knee, a lot of people didn't rec recognize that he had a website, <laughs> the Know Your Rights website that showcased all the things that he did with his funds while he was being ostracized. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, I wanted to uh, pinpoint where we have seen this revitalization, um, recognize the things that athletes have done that are not really covered in the media, and then, you know, also talk about where they can improve because it hasn't been a perfect movement. No, no. This has been guided by, um, and, and as we're now approaching the 10-year anniversary of when the hashtag Black Lives Matter first appeared. And so this is where we are with this book. Mm -hmm.